This is Conceptions and Misconceptions in Studying the Gospels with Dr. Dan Gertner. I'm your host, Tyler Sanders, and today we're looking at the longer ending of Mark. Uh, so this is a bit different than previous episodes, but uh, let's still, you know, let's just start with the text and we'll kind of get there, we'll look at it, and then we'll see where that takes us. So Dr. Gertner, could you, could you help us look at the text? Yeah, sure. We're looking at Mark chapter 16, and we're used to looking at, let's just say, on um, Good Friday or on, especially on Easter Sunday, we're, we're used to looking at uh, the end of the Gospel of Matthew, let's just say, yeah. and the empty tomb. And we see, you know, Jesus raises from the dead, he gives the Great Commission, and, and we see the, the completed story. And this this passage is is confusing, yeah. And it's not confusing just to us. It's been confusing for a very long time. And uh, so we're going to go to Mark chapter sixteen, and we're going to see there's sort of a bit of a roadblock, and uh, we're going to talk about this roadblock today. Yeah. And how for. Uh, Quite some time, probably 1,500 years, people have tried to get around this roadblock. And what are we supposed to do with it? Yeah. So Mark 16, verse 1. When the Sabbath was passed, I'm in the ESV, mm -hmm. uh, Mary Magdalene and Mary, the mother of James and Salome, bought spices so that they might go and anoint him. And very early on the first day of the week, when the sun had risen, they went to the tomb, and they were saying to one another, Who will roll away the stone for us from the entrance of the tomb? And looking up, they saw that the stone had been rolled back. It was very large. And entering the tomb, they saw a young man sitting on the right side, dressed in a white robe, and they were alarmed. And he said to them, Do not be alarmed. You seek Jesus of Nazareth, who was crucified. He has risen. He is not here. See the place where they laid him. But go, tell his disciples and Peter uh, that he is going before you to Galilee. There you will see him just as he told you. And they went out and fled from the tomb, for trembling and astonishment had seized them. And they said nothing to anyone, for they were afraid. Now, then I get, I'm in the ESV Bible. This isn't a study Bible. This is just a normal Bible. And then I have uh, some of the earliest manuscripts do not include 16, 9 through 20. And then I have a footnote. Mm -hmm. uh, and it says, in this footnote, it says, uh, among other things, some manuscripts end the book at 16.8. Others include verses 9 through 20 immediately after verse 8. A few manuscripts insert additional material after verse 14. One, uh, one Latin manuscript adds after verse 8, and then it gives a, a small summary other manuscript includes the same wording after verse 8, then continue with verses 19 or 9 through 20, and, and then verses 9 through 20. Um, now, when he rose early on the first day, and then have what, what's typically presented in, in most of our Bibles, and most of our Bibles have it in some kind of bracket or different colored font or different size font. So what on earth are we supposed to do with that? that that's yeah, I, sort of the question that we're looking at today. Even, even the footnote is complicated because I've got, I do have an ESV study Bible right here with me and it, it has a lot to say about it too, but I don't even think, it doesn't look like it has all that information that you just shared about uh, uh, the variety um, that some have, you know, go to this verse, some go to this verse and, and. It's very, it seems very complicated. And I remember coming across this footnote the first time, you know, I think I was not paying attention in church when I was a kid or something. And uh, I came across it and it was like a little bit shocking. <laughs> I, I, you know, oh, sure. Oh, and oh, and oh, you kind of wonder, well, 
so is this does this belong in our bibles or doesn't it yeah and if it doesn't why do they put it here and if it does why is it in brackets or why why is it in brackets yeah. like this yeah. and for some people who use a king james bible there's probably no brackets or anything at all right so here's here's what i want to introduce to us and where our bible comes from mm. and, and this is this is we're, we're talking about the field of it's a whole discipline of studying the bible called textual criticism the the bible comes to us the, the bible we know at least the new testament is translated from greek well where do we get the greek from the the greek was all the new testament books were written in greek originally by the original authors and then you know they didn't have photocopiers and they didn't have emails so the the way they circulated them were by people copying them by hand so yeah. if tyler writes a letter and somebody wants a copy of that letter they make a copy of it by hand or what mm -hmm. often happened is because so few people knew how to write they would hire somebody to make a copy for them so uh, even if Tyler is a wealthy businessman or something like that, he, he probably doesn't know how to write. Sure. So he pays somebody to do it for him. Well, so it, in, inevitably, you know, let's just say if Tyler's a pastor of a church and he gets a copy of Paul's letter or the Gospel of Mark, and he wants to have this circulated to other pastors that he knows of, and he just he could afford to do that because he's a wealthy businessman. And he wants to have the Gospel of Mark circulated to 20 pastors that he knows throughout the Roman Empire. So he's going to pay to have that done, which is probably pretty expensive, but Tyler's got a lot of money. So he's going to pay one scribe that he happens to know to have those copies made. It, who knows how long it's going to take, but mm. that scribe is a human being. So that scribe might have one copy of the gospel of mark and he's going to make mistakes so sure. those mistakes even though he has one copy that he's going to work from he's going to make 20 copies those 20 copies are not all going to be the same because mm. he's going to make mistakes and those 20 copies are going to go throughout the roman empire and then each one of those 20 pastors is going to have their own copy so now we're maybe about let's just say we're about 300 a.d and then each one of those copies, people are going to make copies from those copies. And those copies are going to have mistakes make it, mm -hmm. made. And those copies, people are going to make copies from those copies. So what happens is over the course of 2,000 years, well, let's just say 1,500 years until the invention of the printing press, which right. is the, the first time when there is a, a, a static text, when a text can actually be reproduced where errors are not going to be made, everything's done by hand by human beings. Eventually, they could mass produce manuscripts in monasteries where somebody could stand up front and read texts out loud and people could copy them. But even then, make mistakes were made. Yeah. Because as you know, if you say uh, the word plain, mm. do you mean plain p-l-a-n-e or plain p-l-a-i-n mm -hmm. well the same thing happens in greek there are different ways that you can spell the same word and yeah. so we have that in the greek new testament where there's different ways to spell the same word that have similar meaning but they're very different words so those the, in that by that in that way the way word uh manuscripts are made and passed along there are always mistakes made so there are really no two manuscripts from the ancient world that are identical that are precisely the same exactly so yeah. th what what we have in the new testament is a translation of what scholars have done is try to recreate what is the original 
hmm. in textual criticism. So try to, you know, we try to go back and find out what the mistakes are to go back to what was the original. That's the, the discipline of textual criticism. So that's how mis- that's how we find out what is the original. Well, then how does something like this end up in the Gospel of Mark? Right. Well, because this is not just a maybe a mistake that somebody put in, but this is something that's that's actually added that that right. that's quite long. This isn't just sort of like a this or a that. Yeah, what's or a likely, misspelled word or something. Yeah, what's likely happened here? Th- there are a few theories. This one is is weird because the. Uh, the the for for this one in Mark sixteen eight, it's unusual to end a literally in Greek. It is they said nothing to anyone. They were afraid for. Hmm. It's the Greek word gar, and it's kind of unusual to end a sentence with the word for in Greek. It's not impossible, but it's kind of unusual. Yeah. It also reminds me of, uh, do you remember the movie Pirates of the Caribbean? Yeah. When somebody says they're talking about the the Black Pearl Mm -hmm. and with a crew so wicked that they always kill everybody and leave no survivors. And Jack says, no survivors, huh? I wonder where the stories come from. Right. Right. So if they told nothing to anyone... How did they know that they told nothing to anyone? Yeah. They must have told something to somebody or what they wouldn't have known that they told nothing to anyone. Right. right? So they must have told somebody to somebody. So, so it doesn't make sense that it ends somewhere. Yeah. So they must have said something to something to somebody or we wouldn't even know this much. Yeah. So ancient readers had a problem with this from very early on. Yeah. From the earliest and most important manuscripts, it ended at 168. So scholars are able to identify which ones are the earliest from a variety of means. And the earliest and the most reliable manuscripts, it ends at 168. Mm-hmm. So there, there's really no question about it. And also the earliest church fathers from Jerome and Eusebius and some of the earliest church had some of the best manuscripts available and, and say that, that there is, they don't have any more endings because there was some debate at their time. Um, say that there was no additional ending. Hmm. There are some additional endings that start to come into being somewhat later. And those additional endings don't agree with each other. Right. The there there are some shorter endings, and they they all con- kind of contradict one another. So very, the point is that very early on, people started to recognize that there was something that seemed incomplete about the Gospel of Mark, and they were trying to fill in the gaps. Right. And the way they filled in the gaps were contradictory. Mm-hmm. The other thing is that the way this longer ending, the way we have it printed in the Bible, has words and expressions that don't sound anything like the rest of the Gospel of Mark. So stylistically. Yes, stylistically. The way Mark, the kind of words that Mark uses, Mm -hmm. and he tends to use the same words like all of us do. Yeah. We have a particular kind of vocabulary. If we asked yeah. your wife, uh, you know, if, if there was a letter that was thought to be written by you and we asked her, she said, oh, yeah, that's Tyler. I know what kind of yeah. words he uses. And if there was something that wasn't written by you, she'd, she'd probably be like, eh, that's not usually what he the way he says things. Yeah, this this is our war. This is words that abruptly are not from Mark, and pretty yeah. starkly, too. The other thing is, it's kind of weird, meaning in, in the context of 16.9 doesn't really make sense. Hmm. Because if you look carefully, 
the longer ending doesn't really flow naturally after 16.8. Jesus is presumed to be the subject of verse 9. Sure, yeah. And uh, the women is the subject of, of 16.8. Yeah. Mary is introduced in verse 9 as if she's not been mentioned in verse 1. That's true, yeah. It, it does. It gives that little, that half sentence kind of about describing who she is, basically. Yeah. Yeah. Like, like we don't know where she, like she's right. just kind of dropped in out of nowhere. Yeah. In verse nine, it says, when Jesus rose early on the first day of the week, which sounds strange mm -hmm. after verse two, which says very early on the first day of the week. That's true too. Yeah. It, it just doesn't. It sounds like whoever wrote verse nine wasn't really. It, it it sounds like it wasn't the same person, or at least wasn't at the same sitting. Right. There's some incongruity. Mm -hmm. So the majority of interpreters of Mark recognize that verses nine through twenty are not original. It, mm -hmm. It's. It's pretty certain that 9 through 20 are not original to Mark. It's a later addition that somebody in the early church, some people in the early church put on to try to make sense of the fact that Mark 16, 8 does not seem to make sense. Now, right. that's kind of common in, in the transmission of manuscripts when, when something doesn't seem to make sense. We naturally want to make it make sense, so we try to fill in the gaps. You know, mm. so how, how many times have you thought, gee, I wonder what Jesus was like when he was five? Um, sure. You know, some of the early church traditions, some of the apocryphal traditions have made up some yeah. stories about what Jesus was like as a child. I remember yeah. when my kids were were it, were uh, potty training, and I would have thought how wonderful it would have been like to um, – uh, I wonder what a what a sinless three year old would have been like because my children were not sinless when they were three, um, you know that sort of thing. Yeah. So our natural curiosities, but but somewhere in in the course of transmission, people added to these manuscripts. Now, so why does it end up in places like the King James, without question, because the the um, the people responsible for the King James, the 1611, ended up using a collection of manuscripts that were largely late and mm. largely from a single collection or a uh, group of manuscripts yeah. like that did include it. Yeah. So, which now we have a much larger and much earlier and much more reliable group of manuscripts than they had in 1611, uh, which give us a better picture of what the, what the original manuscripts uh, included. And the logic of that is earlier manuscripts, we assume are going to be closer to the original, that the, they, the tendency will be to add things as they time goes tend on. to be. That's not universally the case. They tend to be uh, simply because there is less time for errors to be mm. introduced. Mm. And the other tendency is, and I say they tend to be because a manuscript, let's just go back to, to the illustration of your uh, 20 copies that are made. Mm -hmm. And let's just say your the one that, that is in your hands is an earlier one and the one that is three generations later. So a copy is made from yours, a copy is made from that one, and a copy, two copies or three copies later. Yours might be reliable, might be, uh, or the one that's three copies down from yours might be more reliable than another one that is only one copy down from yours if the the copyist from yours maybe had a bad day when he was making your copy yeah. uh, was really distracted on that day or you, you just never know what the mitigating circumstances might be yeah. uh, where the scribe just didn't know the language quite as well or 
you know, something like that. So if there are corruptions that are introduced in the um, in the transmission process, it can be very early. But if it's being copied from a corrupted manuscript, its date it could be an early corruption. Mm -hmm. So uh, the the date doesn't really make much of a difference. The other principle that that um, scholars use for determining the originality is that the shorter mm. a reading is and the more difficult a reading is, the more likely it is to be original. The shorter it is and the more a, a difficult a reading is, the more likely it is to be original. What do I mean by that? What is a scribe more likely to deliberately do? He is more likely to deliberately expand a reading yeah. and mm -hmm. to clarify a reading mm -hmm. than he is to shorten a reading and make it either more obscure or more theologically problematic. Yeah. One of the uh, classic examples in the Gospel of Mark is Mark 141, where Jesus is asked to heal somebody. And Jesus is, the, the variant is, Jesus is either moved with pity hmm. or becomes indignant. So which one is it? Sure. Now yeah. we want to say, of course he's moved with pity. Right. But which that is, which is like a scribe fits. more likely to do? Is he more likely to see moved with pity and change it to became indignant? Or is he more right. likely to see indignant and change it to moved with pity? Right. That argues that the indignant is more likely the original reading. Yeah. And that's kind of where that idea of the more difficult reading comes in. Yes. Or more complex kind of. Sure. Yes. Yeah. So with this one in particular, with, with the longer ending, much of the discussion today uh, among interpreters of Mark is not whether 16, uh, 9 through 20 was original or not. Uh, because most people in most people recognize that 16, 9 through 20 is not original. Mm -hmm. There are really three questions. Did Mark intend to write more, but didn't? Uh, it was prevented from doing so by his death, by his arrest, mm. um, or, or something like that. Yeah. Somehow, for some reason, the writing process was interrupted. Is it the case that Mark did write more and somehow it, it was lost? Hmm. Um, so, w which we just, the difficulty is we just have no evidence for that. Yeah. You know, is it, so how would you even know? Well, mm -hmm. is there some literary feature in the Gospel of Mark that suggests, like a chiasm, that suggests that there should be another other end right. of the chiasm or something yeah. in a manuscript that shows that there's a, a trail off at the end of something that shows that there, there was something more? We, we yeah. just like a, or a codex of something that shows that mm. there, there was more somewhere. Uh, we just we just don't we just don't have anything. Or is there uh, that's becoming more popular recently that Mark intended it to end at sixteen eight, and he sort of lets the spe the story speak for itself, hmm. almost an enigmatic ending. Yeah, the reader knows at six, so there there is no ambiguity. About Jesus raised from the dead, sixteen eight. He ex Mark explicitly says he is risen. He is not here. See the place where they laid him. So there's. It's not like yeah. Mark. Mark doesn't let us know what happened. Yeah. So the reader knows the confusion and the astonishment of the women leaves us wondering about what it all means and what we are going to do with it. Yeah. And so it's more of a, 
I don't want to get overly philosophical, but it's more of an existential and experiential kind of encounter with the reader, making us ponder, uh, you know, how are we going to, how are we going to handle this? So I, I'm not sure where I stand on all this. I, I tend yeah. to think that maybe it was deliberate, but I don't know. I mean, it does but seem th- like- Those are the questions that, that interpreters are wrestling with more today. Yeah, which which is an interesting development, I think. I mean, you do have this history of it being added into the text. I mean, we, you've kind of, I mean, that's the reason it's in the KJV, right? Is because there are a lot of manuscripts over probably hundreds of years that had this additional ending in it. So that is a fascinating thing. But it, I, I'm interested that we're we've moved past that. And now we're trying to kind of figure out like why. Why Why is verse 8 such kind of a fascinating, uh, interesting, or such a particular way to end it? Which there is a, a terse style, I think, in Mark, but that still would be a very, that's a strong cutoff, I think, to end uh, uh, in the book on. It is. It is. And I think, I mean, most of the conversations of this nature are more happening in the academic world. Hmm. And I think for the purposes of this podcast, I think it's important that in in the church, we recognize that, that I think it's important that we, that we put 16, nine through 20 to one side and recognize that this is not scripture. I mean, I still have friends who still will occasionally cite this as scripture and I, and and it's not, and I think we can be okay with that. And I think we need to deal with in God's providence, for now at least, we recognize that sixteen eight is the ending, mm-hmm. and we need to deal with that, whether it is deliberate or whether it is accidental, for or whatever it is. This is what we have, and so we need to deal with the fact that. Uh, so so let's deal with. How is it that it ends this way, and what does this yeah. say to us as readers today? Yeah, about the the ambiguity and the terseness, as you point out, and how are we going to respond to this news about telling people? Are we going to tell tell nothing to anybody, mm. or are we going to make it known? Sure. Yeah. It, it puts it out there. It's a little bit, it reminds me a bit, I feel like everything I, I say ends up coming back to the book of Jonah, but that's a little bit, it reminds me a bit of the ending of, of Jonah. It's a little bit, it kind of ends on a question almost of like, it doesn't just explain everything to you. You kind of get this enigmatic ending and Jonah's kind of faced with this conversation with God and he's like, and God's like, well, yeah, I didn't destroy Nineveh, but like, what did you expect necessarily? Like, this is a very important city with all these people. And I think it says all these like cattle or all these animals, you know, and it kind of ends there without saying, uh, tying a bow on it in the way we always maybe, or the way we sometimes expect it to. Um, that's kind of what this reminds me of a little bit. It kind of leaves it up in the air. Yeah, it leaves it up in the air, but I think at the same time, it tells you what you need to know. Hmm. For these women, and I think for us, it tells us what we need to know. We need to know that Jesus suffered and died as a ransom for many, and that he raised from the dead, according to scriptures, just as he said he would do. Yeah. And that's really what what we need to know. Yeah. So, and just as we've said any number of times... And, you know, we've we've looked in a number of passages in this podcast of, you know, I wonder what they knew about this. And let's think about the background Mm. of that, that the gospel authors have some of those things are very fascinating. Dead Sea Scrolls, the Jewish background, the history, the context. I love that stuff. I'm all about that stuff. But at the end of the day, everything we need to know is right here. Mm. The gospel authors tell us what we need to know. Yeah. There's more we could know. But everything we need to know is right here. Yeah. And I think Mark tells us what we need to know. Yeah. And that's right here. Yeah. But what I'm try- also trying to illustrate for us is that though the words are God's words, the the question is not here, is God's word the inerrant, infallible, trustworthy word of God? 
the question here is with this longer ending which which is the inerrant and inspired word of god and i'm mm. saying that the verses 9 through 20 is not part of that yeah so it's not whether it's not whether God's word is trustworthy or not. And students often, my students sometimes get tripped up over that. Can I really trust the Bible? Right. Well, of course we can trust the Bible. I'm just saying yeah. that this isn't this isn't part of the Bible because the way the Bible was transmitted until the invention of the printing press was yeah. a was a very fallible process. The Bible is not fallible, but the transmission of the Bible is fallible. Yeah. So we just need to recognize it, and the the vast majority of the the way the mistakes that are uh, introduced in this process of uh, transmitting by hand uh, uh, of over the course of you know fourteen hundred years are, are very insignificant and have nothing to do with 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 doctrinal issues whatsoever. Right. Right. Yeah, Dr. Wegner shown me a little bit about this. Uh, we've looked a little bit at some. Um, well, we we received a uh, um, a Torah scroll recently, and he did an assessment on it, and he has some photos and stuff. And so he's shown me some of the stuff, and and a lot of it is just like you said, it's very inconsequential and it's very simple stuff sometimes. Just like what character exactly is this? Because some of these Hebrew characters look very similar, sure. and the way this guy wrote this, it's just hard to tell, you know. But uh, it's like either way, like kind of still you come at the same, you can come to the same conclusion, you know, so a lot of it is very inconsequential, but this is a very big section of scripture. And I think that's why it's an important one to, to talk about. And, and a lot of times these, these notes are in your Bible aren't as significant as this one, but this is a big one. This is a footnote in most modern English translations that people are going to come across. Sure. And I'm, I'm guessing that that um, Crossway, the publisher of the ESV, puts this in because this is such an important passage mm. um, historically for for most Christians, especially who have been raised on the King James, who yeah. are used to seeing this in their Bibles and wondering, what am I supposed to do with this? Yeah, I, I'm pretty sure I don't have the I'm, I'm kind of looking at it. I don't see it exactly, but I think in the study Bible, the footnote says something to that, that basically this has been in for a long time. And so, you know, they, they wanted to leave it in to kind of represent that historically this had been um, in for a very long time. Yeah. There's another passage of a similar nature. I just, just want to mention, and you and I have talked about this before, and you'll see a similar notation on this. and. That is the uh, the woman caught in adultery, mm. and that is in John seven fifty three through eight eleven. This is something that you and I have talked about uh, briefly, and that's also been the subject of some academic conversation, and it is sometimes called uh, the most famous biblical story that's not in the Bible. Mm. And this one gets to be controversial because uh, this is often a favorite Bible story. Sure, yeah. And so sometimes I'm reluctant to even bring it up. But this is the one where, you know, he who's without sin, let him cast the first stone yeah. in uh, John seven fifty three through 8, 11, which is, again, in the ESV has some manuscripts do not include uh, this passage and its discussion is is similar uh, to that of of Mark sixteen nine through twenty and actually even more problematic in some respects. Hmm. There are a few passages like that, but these are probably the two largest in terms of as you as you say, not just a a few words or a couple sentences here and there, yeah, but an actual story. Yeah, it's not to say that in my opinion this this may very well have happened. Mm -hmm. But it's just it's just not part of John, right? Right. Which I think gets back to that that kind of the two questions you brought up, right? We have an answer to the first one of whether the Bible is infallible and inerrant and reliable. the The bigger question is kind of what what is categorized in the Bible, essentially, right? Right. Well, I think this has really been very helpful information to go 
over. Uh, do you have anything else you'd want to say just about about how how people can maybe how people can respond to this um, if they get questions about it? I think just recognizing that you know there's there's often debate in public spheres um, that that can turn into turn into um, data spinning. Hmm. Popularly, Bart Ehrman and um, uh, likes to do debates with Dan Wallace from Dallas Seminary. Bart Ehrman's a former evangelical and a text critic who knows all this data, and mm-hmm. he spins the data one way. Uh, and then Dan Wallace, who's a text critic who who is an evangelical, spins the data a different way, and they're all looking at the set, same data. Yeah, and it, they can look at the same data and say make very different conclusions by it. I, I just I want to affirm that just that that the scriptures are reliable yeah. and that looking at the, a variation in how a, a couple words are placed here and there and what words may vary and two extended passages may or may not be part of an original it does not undermine uh, just the the mountainous trustworthiness mm. of God's word. So, yeah, yeah, you can and you can Google those debates between Bart Ehrman and Dan Wallace, and I think you'll kind of you can kind of get an idea of of sort of how that data spinning sort of works. But um, I just I think it's important to be aware. That the that in God's providence, the transmission of His Word, He's left to a very human task. He could have done like He did with the stone tablets in mm. at Mount Sinai and just just drop them from from heaven uh, yeah. and give them to us. But in His providence, He's chose to do this in a very human way, and I think we can acknowledge that and honor Him by acknowledging that and recognizing that uh, there are variations, and in His sovereignty, yeah. He's preserved His Word for us. Yeah, absolutely. Well, thank you so much for your time today, Dr. Gertner. Uh, it's always encouraging to be able to talk about challenging sections of, uh, of Scripture with you. And uh, I'm looking forward to the next conversation we have. My pleasure. My pleasure.